This video is brought to you by staring at yourself really closely in the mirror. You know, really taking the time to drink it all in and just think, Jeez, I look like garbage. Wonder Woman on the surface might not have as many Easter eggs and references as you'd think, seeing as it's set 100 years before any of the other films in the DCEU. But then when you realise you have to make a 10 minute video on it to appease the YouTube algorithm, you, you just, you go for it, you know? So spoilers for Wonder Woman 2017, as all this is going to get into the comics, previous and upcoming movies, her origin, characters that appear, parallels to the first Avenger, and almost certainly other things. Also at the end, as always, there'll be a Loot Crate giveaway, so stick around for that, if you want. Wonder Woman takes influence from a number of comic book sources, but director Patty Jenkins has clarified that although the film picks and chooses from a number of stories, there are really two key comic runs of inspiration. The first being the original issues from creator William Moulton Marsden. He developed the character on the back of thinking that comics in the 1940s had a lot of unfulfilled potential, and when building the idea of this new superhero, it was his wife Elizabeth who suggested making her a woman. Jenkins also credits George Perez's post-crisis run. It was his idea to have have Wonder Woman lean more heavily into the mythical nature of the character. He was the person responsible for renaming Paradise Island Themyscira, which is seen in the movie. Steve Trevor actually even refers to Themyscira as Paradise Island at one point. But it was also his idea to have the Greek gods interfere with mortals. Perez also chose to address issues not really touched upon in Wonder Woman comics before, including domestic violence, discrimination, and misogyny. There's a few other moments taken from the comics. Diana remarking how good ice cream is, and how the vendor should be proud. That's from the first New 52 issue of Justice League. That moment is also seen in Justice League War, a 2014 animated movie. Wonder Woman also fought along with the Allies in World War II, in the original stories. That however was changed to World War I for the movie. And the moment where she lifts the armoured vehicle could have also been taken from 2001's Wonder Woman Spirit of Truth by Paul Dini with art by Alex Ross. The origin of the cinematic version of Wonder Woman also takes inspiration from a few places. Originally, like what was mentioned in the film, Diana was said to have been moulded from clay. This wasn't really explained in any depth. I mean, these are the panels. Someone makes a clay model of a girl and then it comes to life. Origins are fun, aren't they? Diana was created to be as beautiful as Aphrodite, as wise as Athena, and swifter than Hermes. In the New 52, however, this was retconned, and it's more in line with what we got in the film. Wonder Woman was told she was modelled from clay, but in fact she's the daughter of Zeus, and the story was spread that she was birthed from clay to protect her from harm. The other children also nicknamed her clay as a kind of insult, because you know, kids can be pretty cruel. Not in this case, however. That's a pretty crap attempt at mockery. This, however, may have been retconned again, as in the latest version of her origin has become unclear. So stay tuned! Wonder Woman's powers and weapons have changed over the years. But let's talk about those that appear in the film. Her abilities are still kind of vague, but this is what she appears to have based off both Wonder Woman and Batman v Superman. Super strength, though she doesn't appear to be bulletproof, and despite healing rapidly, she's still able to be cut. She is, however, fast enough that she can see bullets moving through the air and is able to block them. Also, I guess this version can fly? At least according to the closing moments of the film. Or at the very least, she's able to jump in very slow motion. Her bracelets are built from Athena's shield, and they're indestructible. But like all indestructible comic book weapons, they've probably been destructed at some point. They're able to deflect all manner of things, magic attacks, bullets, and energy blasts, like we saw with her fight against Doomsday. Also, when struck together, they can create a concussive force. Once when fighting Superman, she waited till she was sure that he was using his super hearing, you know, really listening out for her, and then she clapped his ears with her bracelets so hard that it caused him to bleed. He did not care for it. The sword she carries is referred to as the God Killer. Most of the newer versions of Wonder Woman is seen with a sword. Forged by Hephaestus, it's said to be so sharp that it can cut the electrons of an atom. In the comics though, the God Killer sword doesn't belong to Wonder Woman, but to Deathstroke, though it was still forged by Hephaestus. I'm not really sure if there's anything particular about the movie version of this sword. It might just be a regular sword, said to be a god killer, as to distract from Diana's true identity. Whatever it was, it's probably gone now for good. Seems as in the present day, she has a completely different weapon. Her tiara in the movie is worn in memory of her aunt, Antiope. However, in the comics, it's been capable of a few things. It's been used as a throwing weapon. In some versions, it's actually razor sharp. And in others, it just slaps Superman on the back of his head. He does not care for it. Her lasso of truth does a thing that it pretty much does in every incarnation, though sometimes it is depicted as having mind control abilities. But here it appears to be a virtually indestructible glowing rope that makes the person caught in it speak the truth. Interesting fact, Wonder Woman's creator, William Moulton Marston, also invented the polygraph, a notoriously unreliable lie detecting method. Well, 
one version of that machine. A few people are kind of credited with, with its creation, but only one of them also created Wonder Woman. Would you like to have a guess which one of them did? Here are your options. Alright, look, it's none of these. None of the people or cheeses here are William Moulton Marsden. This is Thomas Crapper, inventor of the flush toilet. This is the inventor of the shake weight, whose name I do not know. And this is a selection of popular cheeses. What, what, what have we got here? This appears to be some, some blue vein. There appears to be some kind of sharp cheddar. Alright, I could talk cheeses all day, but we've got to keep going. A number of characters appear from the comics, but due to the altered timeline of the film, a few of them went through some significant changes. Steve Trevor was initially a World War II pilot who crash lands on Paradise Island, where Diana and him meet and eventually fall in love. A lot of their relationship during the 50s and 60s involved Wonder Woman pining, pun intended, over Trevor, wishing to marry him, and he even once used government spy equipment to determine whether or not Diana loved somebody else. When his origin was changed after Crisis, he was made a retired four-star general because making him older removed the relationship angle from their dynamic. That dynamic though has since returned. Also, Steve Trevor dying is not uncommon. He's done it a couple of times and each time he's come back. I wouldn't rule out Chris Pine's reappearance also. Maybe Steve Trevor's got a great grandson who looks exactly like him, or perhaps the Flash grabs him out of time or something, because we know from Batman v Superman that he is capable of some form of time travel, probably, I don't know. Also, I forgot to mention this earlier, Remember that bit when he's taking a bath? That might actually be the DC version of the Fountain of Youth, which is found on Themyscira. The crew he hangs out with appear to be based loosely off the Blackhawks, a group of World War II fighter pilots of varying nationalities, though none of them other than Trevor appear to be pilots. Etta Candy is a character from way back. The thing about her is she just loved bloody candy. That's what she was about. And I guess having a person named Candy, loving candy, was what passed as a joke in, in the 40s. That's, that's pretty good. She's got Gone through a number of changes and occupations, including secretary to Steve Trevor, and recently she was promoted to Commander Candy. Edda also says at one point that Diana is trying on outfit number 226, which could refer to Wonder Woman issue 226, the final issue of the post-crisis run written by Greg Rucker. Okay, so there's been a few variations on Dr. Poison. This one, however, Maru, is the original and worked in the Poison Division for the Nazis. She actually ended up doing herself in as she created a drug called Reverso that reverses your age. She accidentally ingested this and then turned into a fetus and died. Pretty embarrassing. Ares actually appears in the very first issue of Wonder Woman from 1942 as the God of War. In the next issue, he reappears under the Roman name Mars, which he kept until 1987 for some reason, despite that being a much less intimidating name. His look has varied over the years, but most versions appear somewhat like what we ended up getting in this film. Antiope, or Antiope, if you want to upset people with knowledge of either Greek mythology or comics, wasn't originally Hippolyta's sister, but a rival who plotted to overthrow her. This was retconned in the 80s, with them becoming sisters. Hippolyta, we talked about, she's the mother of Diana. Interestingly, well I think so, she's taken on the mantle of Wonder Woman herself. Which kind of reminds me of the time that Alfred posed as Batman in the 1960s series. Bless my vertigo. Well, look at that. Look, look at him go. There's also a few minor Amazonian characters that appear, including Anne Wolfe as Artemis. And if you've got a keen eye, you just might spot Zack Snyder as one of the soldiers in the trenches before Wonder Woman ventures into No Man's Land. I apparently do not have a keen eye. I did not see him. This being a prequel means that Wonder Woman ties into previous, but also future films in the series, despite being set 100 years in the past. In Batman v Superman, she mentions that she's taken on monsters before. It's from another world. I've killed things from other worlds before. This could refer to her battle with Ares. However, there's a huge time gap between these films, so she could be referring to any number of things. Bruce Wayne, or Batman, doesn't appear in person in this film. However, we do see a Wayne Enterprises truck, as well as some correspondence from him, inquiring about her backstory. He also hands over the original image of her that we saw from Batman v Superman. It's also implied in a number of comics, and more heavily in Justice League Unlimited, that Batman is in love with Wonder Woman, but they've never really formed a relationship, at least not in the same way that her and Superman have in a number of incarnations. It's possible we'll see a bit of that in our Justice League. We also get a painting come to life to tell the back story of the Amazons. Feels very reminiscent of the Kryptonian pin art we saw in Man of Steel. Each of them kind of rely on imagery or technology appropriate to their culture to tell their origin. There was also this rumor that never got beyond that that the Amazons are actually going to end up being early Kryptonians as opposed to actual gods. Since as Kryptonians visited Earth 
thousands of years ago. Obviously that didn't happen. Also, it would have removed the whole Greek god element from her story. There's a new DC intro at the start also. It seemingly confirms that Green Lantern will be the seventh Justice League member, as he appears after Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Cyborg, Aquaman, and The Flash. It does look a lot like the Hal Jordan version. However, Aquaman also looks like the blonde-haired incarnation from the comics. So I wouldn't necessarily say that Hal Jordan's going to be the first Green Lantern to show up. There's also a stack of other DC characters that we might potentially see. I don't have a definitive list, but I saw at least Hawkman and Green Arrow, probably. Also, intentional or not, there's a few parallels to Captain America, the first Avenger. The wartime setting, obviously, even though it's a different war. The introduction of a group very similar to the Howling Commandos. Plus the death of Steve Trevor bears a striking resemblance to the supposed death of Steve Rogers. Both of them take a plane loaded with a very dangerous weapon and sacrifice their life to ensure the safety of others. Maybe it's a coincidence, or you know what, maybe it isn't. Both Wonder Woman and Captain America also pay homage to the likes of adventure films such as Indiana Jones. I, I was very proud in that clip of uh, the old hit yeah, uh, ham deal. Feels very Harrison Fordish. In fact, Chris Pine mentioned that both Romancing the Stone and Indiana Jones were in mind when creating his character. Patty Jenkins also wanted this movie to feel very much in the vein of the first Superman movie with Christopher Reeve. She aimed to give it a sense of fun and hope and for it to be inspiring. And there are a few notable nods to that film. It's thought by some that her wearing glasses is a reference to Christopher Reeve. And it could be, but Diana Prince has worn glasses tons of times before. But the scene in the alley where she protects Steve Trevor by taking out the German spies, that's clearly meant to be a spin on Clark catching a bullet from Superman in 1978. One last thing, Linda Carter is thanked in the credits, which makes sense. Her portrayal of the character in the 70s brought a new level of popularity to Wonder Woman and is considered by many to be classic 70s TV, meaning by today's standards it, it's borderline unwatchable. Though she's great and she's good in Sky High too. That's not a bad film. It's got, it's got Kurt Russell also, he's pretty good. Alright, that'll do it. Here's the winner of last week's Loot Crate. If you are that person, just private message me these details details on my channel and it's all yours. And if you want to win next week's box, just leave any comment below. Perhaps on your favourite easter egg or reference from the film, or even something that I've missed. Also, if you are interested, our latest episode of Caravan of Garbage is up. It's on Mortal Kombat vs DC. That's quite a game. Here's a clip. Get out of here, Shang Tsung. <laughs> Go back to where you came from, and I don't mean that in a race way, I mean that in a dimensional <laughs> way. Just to be clear, take your barackas with you. That's right. You son of a bitch. And your disgusting cuisine. Oh, it got racial again. <laughs> I'm saying nether realm cuisine. Okay. It's probably it's probably a lot. You're eating a you're eating a nice pasta, <laughs> yeah. and then you look down and it's worms all of a sudden. Yeah, it's definitely it's worms. Yeah. Magic, yeah, you know? exactly. That's linked below if you care. Along with my podcast, The Weekly Planet, where this Monday we're talking Wonder Woman 2017 in all sorts of detail. The good, the not so good, everything in between. It's a spectrum. But thanks for watching this. I appreciate it. Take care.